Welcome to Saks Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Welcome to our Tuesday Night Podcast. Tonight, we are going to talk about commercial real estate. I know we have primarily spoken about the housing market and uh, but you know we we have to remember that there is an important element to every neighborhood really and you know it's not just office buildings it's retail space it's restaurants it's industrial space <clears throat> excuse me and it, everything's changing so rapidly and you know i think um something that we've been hearing in the news about the uh, recent bank collapse and um you know it sort of brought to the surface this situation where uh, no one is really talking about commercial real estate and, you know, the pressure that that puts on regional banks. So we've been talking about big banks, but, you know, a lot of the regional banks, they sell their, um, their residential loans, but they actually portfolio their commercial loans. And we're going to talk about it tonight. Um, We would love to hear from you. Uh, it's just Melissa and I tonight. We are going to dive in, talk about office space and how everybody is working from home and sort of, uh, you know, kind of go from there. But we would love to hear from you tonight. So, you know, a couple of things that we'd really like to know is, are you working remotely still? Do you have the type of job where you can work from home? And we want to talk about whether you like that. Do you like working from home? And if you are an employer, we want to hear from you. We want to know, you know, what's going on. Are you trying to get your employees back to work? Are you happy with them staying at home? Are you in leases that you wish you could get out from under? Is your lease expiring and you're not planning on renewing? Are you downsizing? So uh, we'll start it out. Uh, Melissa. Hello. Hello, everyone. Going? Really great. Another another Tuesday. Another Tuesday coming off Easter weekend, which was fantastic. So it's great to be here. And I, guys, I see your comments and questions already coming in, and we are going to get to them. But yeah, we want to hear from you. You know, what is your current working situation? We hear that um, you know, the commercial then affects the residential real estate or vice versa. So we're going to really talk about that. And, um, I know personally, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but I, um, went around to some local offices and it was interesting, my findings when I did that, but we'll talk about that soon. But yeah, gr- it's great to be here, you guys. And it's great to be here on another Tuesday night. So yes, Todd, let's dive into our topic tonight. You know, prior to the pandemic, and I've spoke about this before, I went to a conference down in Nashville, Tennessee. Tennessee. It was called the Internet of Things, and it was through BOMA, Building Owners and Managers Association. And this was back in 2017. Melissa, they were talking back then, uh, and you've heard me mention it before and in meetings, they were talking about how office space, the office demand was really shrinking. And, you know, uh, People have been working remotely for many, many years prior to the pandemic. And I think that the pandemic sort of slowed it down. I guess the office, you know, space being, you know, reduced and eliminated. I think it kind of slowed it down because people weren't ready for it quite, you know, as it happened. I think that people, you know, we like to prepare for things in business you know, we like to, you know, do it on our terms as business owners and managers. So we know that office space was getting ridiculously expensive. We know that square footage demand per employee was being reduced because back in the day, 30 years ago, a lot of people had their own private offices. Then it went to cubicles and now it's been going more to open work areas. And so I think when the pandemic hit in 2020, um, and it forced everybody at home. Businesses were like, whoa, like, I, you know, we have to keep things going, but they weren't prepared for a complete office shutdown. And so I think it's been an adjustment. People were buying computers for their employees mm-hmm. at homes, you know, cameras um, like we're on, you know, tonight. 
um, and you couldn't find them. I remember I was trying to find a camera so we could just zoom our office meetings and our inner, you know, uh, client uh, meetings and you couldn't find the cameras. Uh, you had to buy them, you know, very uh, overpriced on like eBay and stuff like that. But, um, but now it's kind of weird because the pandemic is over and people are trying to get their employees back to work some, and then others are saying, you know, we're completely fine with the way it is and, you know, or at least some type of hybrid model. So the question that we have that's really going on in America is what will happen to vacancy rates in these buildings? Um, no one wants vacant buildings in their neighborhood, in their area, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but what will they do with these buildings? And, um, you know, will offices come back? So, you know, um, 33 years, going into my 34th year in business, uh, we could take a little walk down memory lane and um, and see some of the changes. This was something like the <laughs> computer that I first started with when I opened up my business. And uh, I had an office with employees. And, I, and this is kind of like what the offices look like. If you guys remember the <laughs> cubicle-based workspace kind of weird and then i flashed it up for a second but now we're looking at you know sort of what modern office space has evolved into and you know uh cushman wakefield a big player in the commercial space published a new report in february i think it was published on the 22nd but their uh in their report they said that 70% of the nation's office stock or the office space was built prior to 1990. Uh, and it does not match the preferences of today's occupiers and that as leases are expiring and guys, so just to kind of give you an idea, I mean, this is what it was like in 1990. Uh, this is the computer system that we used back in 1990, the old CRT machines, terminals, um, I think my first work computer was like, uh, had orange and another computer had green letters. Um, I had a dot matrix printer, uh, something that was very noisy, made a lot of noise, but 1990. So when we're looking at 70% of the nation's office buildings, their build out was built prior to 1990. So these buildings are completely obsolete, you know, obsolete, um, and Melissa, you were going to say, so go ahead. What, what, what were you yeah. going to say about? Well, I first want to say, um, you know, about talking remote. So many of you are saying that you work from home and you love it. And I'm going to say, so, you know, March of what was that? 2020, right. Is when everything shut down. I think it was right around St. Patrick's day. And we, at Sex Realty started working from home that week. And we did not know what was going to happen because it was essential business. So we did not know if what was real estate essential business at that time, at that exact day. So we were like, okay, you know, we're going to work from home. And I didn't want to work from home. I mean, I work better in an office setting. So like it was good for a couple of days. And then I'm like, Todd, like I, I, I can't. So we had, you know, our content creator, Joe, who's behind the scenes today. And we kind of had the three of us had a conversation that, you know, we're going to separate. We're going to, Joe's going to be upstairs. I'm going to be downstairs because we had to, I, and Joe, I, think feels the same way that I do, that we work much better and we missed each other too. And I mean, it was only a week, but we really missed being around each other. So really we did not work from home and we were considered, you know, a, an essential business. And thankfully we, we got to work. We got to come into the office. Thank goodness. Um, so I know that some of you say you love it and that's wonderful. And, you know, some of you even just have um, jobs that you work from home anyway. I can see that in here too. But 
um, I just wanted to say that about myself because I, and I'm sure some of you do as well, work better in the office. But yes, currently bringing us up to current day, I went around, we had a broker's open. We were inviting agents from different offices. I was just making the rounds locally and all, I'm going to say probably 99, 95%, the door was either locked or there was no one in there. I even walked into one office wide open, no one in there. So it was just very interesting to see that it's just, it's not what it used to be. And um, a lot of people are working from home. So that is a concern for all these commercial spaces. Yeah, I think you went to 19 offices, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, handing out brokers open. So it's like a a little party that we were having in a, a listing that was launching that day. And we were just going around. We had a cellist in the evening. It was very elegant. We had, yeah, you know, butler nice. hors d'oeuvres. And we were just trying to invite agents, you know, a little more personalized than just sending emails that people don't look at. And that's the other thing. I mean, what we've turned to since the 1990s is a society, really a workforce that hides behind emails, text messages, you know, they screen their calls and I get it. We get a lot of spam calls, but the things that have changed haven't necessarily been good for business either. So, I mean, you were going in 19 offices, no one was there. It was a ghost town mm -hmm. and, you know, real estate back in the day, you know, um, agents went to the office because that's how they got their leads. I mean, you, they had what was called, you know, up an up desk, um, you know, or a call desk, you know, where you, you were on floor duty, call duty. And basically an agent would take a calendar would come out, agent would block out time and they would essentially, you know, be in a room doing some paperwork or whatever, waiting for, you know, the, uh, the receptionist <laughs> at the time to pick up the phone. If it was a sales call, then they would route it to the agent in the call room or the call desk. And that's how agents got their leads. We used to meet clients face to face for the first time at the office. You know, it was a big deal, right? Being at the office, it was a lot of camaraderie and things like that. But, you know, now these offices are sitting empty. And, you know, what I think what happened and a lot of the polls that I've read and speaking to a lot of people also is that when the pandemic first happened and people started working from home, the employers made out really well because the employees, there was no off time. And, you know, though they may go to Target at 11 o'clock, they were working at six, seven o'clock in the evening, just doing their work. And I think everybody, no one else really knew what to do. And they were just diving deep into the work, trying to stay motivated. But then as the pandemic continued, I think people started getting lazy. Mm -hmm. And then depression was starting to set in with a lot of people that I spoke with. And they didn't even want to get out of bed. You yeah. know, so, you know, they were lonely, people living at home alone. And, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, they're still, they're pulling the covers over their heads where they would normally be at the office. You know, so they're up much earlier, showering, getting ready, driving to work. And so... I, I think that employers started seeing it go the opposite way to where they were getting less production from their employees. And now they're trying to pull people back. The problem with that is people don't want to go back. That's right. A lot of them. I mean, Melissa, yeah. you know, you know, it's hard. I mean, want to work, right. You get some people, you know, it's just, it's, as I said, it's, it's better to get out of the house, but then it's very easy when you're in that routine years of it. I mean, it's very hard to get the motivation again, um, to get back into the routine. And I think that that's where we are with a lot of people. And then there's a lot of companies that are saying, come back. And then you've got the employees are saying, I don't want to come back. Um, maybe some hybrid options are thrown in there to potentially, you know, be the best of both worlds for some of these employees. I don't know, but it's definitely causing a strain because what is going to be happening to all of the office space? Well, you know, it's, and we're going to talk about that too, because there are a lot of uh, things that can happen with the office building <laughs> besides it being torn down. 
Um, I think a lot of them will be converted to multifamily housing or mixed use use with a combination of some retail office and then apartments, which we don't need. I mean, I, you may think that we do, but we don't, we've got a, a glut of multifamily housing that is either, you know, already built or in the pipeline. Um, but, you know, for a lot of these people that are being called back to the office, they bought houses, they bought into the philosophy that, you know, they were working remote. A lot of businesses were saying that they were going to be remote indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I've spoken to a lot of young people, a lot of millennials, and they've said, if my work calls me back to the office, I'm looking for a new job. And my response to every one of them has been, well, you may not want to do that quite yet because, you know, I think we still have uh, lots of trouble in the economy. But I, one of the things that I want to talk about here is, um, you know, through time, you know, what, when I showed that picture of the way offices used to look with cubicles, people needed a lot more space for their employees. And, you know, I've done some commercial real estate sales and leasing and through the years. And, um, you know, a big thing when you're trying to meet with a commercial tenant and you're helping them to determine, you know, how much space they need, there were rules of thumb. I mean, there still are, but when you try and figure out, you know, like how much space do you need? How many employees do you have? how many parking spaces do you need? You know, do you have people that come into your office patients or clients? Uh, do you have vehicles, a sales force that you provide? You know, if you're, if you're a termite company, maybe you have, you know, 15 vans or trucks that the employees don't take home, but they come in and they, so you need parking for these. But when we were looking at office space, we really wanted to know how many employees they had, what they thought their projected growth would be over the course of the lease. Because one thing when you're renting space is you don't want disruption in your company. You know, you don't want to, you know, be focusing on looking for another place to move. You want to be focusing on sales and making money when you're a business owner. But as we look at this, that really dates back to like the 1990s, 1996, you can really see the historical trend. The red line is the average square foot requirement per worker. And when we're looking at that, we're looking at, you know, waiting rooms, um, combination of reception areas, um, cafeteria areas or lunch rooms, training or uh, conference rooms. And then individual office space and executive space too, because a lot of the company executives back in the day, now CEOs sit out on the floor with the rest of their staff, a lot of them. Uh, but when we're looking at this, we kind of peaked at about 2009, 2010, where an average employee required about 210 square feet. Now, depending on what kind of business you are, the projections are as we're moving forward is that these will drop this this requirement will drop down below 170 we're even seeing in more more like um let's just take our business real estate where you can even get down to 80 90 square feet per employee because you're sitting in a workroom with just a small divider and a computer screen or a laptop station or something like that but the difference, so let's just kind of go over some of those numbers. So what that means really um, is if you had 15 employees, you know, back in the peak of the maximum space we've seen historically in 2009, 2010, if you had like 15 employees, you needed about 3,200 square feet of office space. And what the predictions are is that's going to drop to about 2,200 to 2,400 square feet. So, you know, really a thousand square feet less required space for the same amount of employee, employees as time goes on. And that's just because, you know, open workspace, things like that, and people not coming to the office. I mean, we look at a 1,600 or 2,000 square foot office in real estate, you can probably have about 200 agents. Melissa, we've done these calculations. You can have about 200 agents 
on your roster for about 2,000 square feet of office space. And we know that because how few times the agents come into the office. And, you know, and a lot of companies are doing their their required meetings, you know, remotely. Mm -hmm. So that's a big drop. It is. And also like talking about the agents, all of them work differently. Like some of them don't have, you know, some of them do maybe one or two transactions a year and then some are off the charts with 20, 25, upwards of 30 or more. So it, that's a big range there. Um, yeah, I would like to um, address this question though, Todd, since you just had mentioned that, just so we're clear on this, we had... Um, Roberta asked, a glut where? Isn't the shortage of affordable housing the reason rent has gone up in all major markets? What can you say to that? Yeah, so a glut is in most of the major cities. So if you're going to Houston or Phoenix or you know Nashville, Tennessee, um, I mean, cranes were, if you needed a crane two years ago, I mean, there was like a multi-year wait list for cranes in America. And that was because of them building especially around, you know, these, these uh, high demand cities. I mean, Nashville, Tennessee, I think they were growing by more than a hundred people a day for the last decade. So, you know, they were building all these multifamily buildings, these high rise apartments, you know, all of your uh, universities, all of your colleges uh, were building, you know, uh, high end uh, student housing that have now been converted to apartment buildings, not just student housing, because, you know, I think you know, over the next couple of years, we're going to see even universities start to struggle with, you know, the high tuitions, online courses, uh, people not going to college because of the college debt. So when you look a lot of these buildings, these big student housing, uh, what was geared towards student housing, they're going to be looking to turn those into just, you know, everyday apartments to keep the, you know, the mortgage payments paid, to keep the investors happy. So, you know, the problem is in the pandemic, it slowed it down because we had supply chain issues. So now we're starting to see where a lot of these apartment buildings are already starting to slash rents. Uh, you know, they're offering 15 month leases, uh, you know, for, you know, the price of 12 months or, you know, two months free, uh, you know, with signing. Uh, it, it's it's amazing what we're, we're starting to see. They would rather give a few months rent or an extended lease period um, for the same rent price rather than drop the rental rates. That's the least thing they want to do because then they're building comps and setting a downward pricing trend. But rents are going down in America. I mean, look, Jay Powell has you know pretty much said the Fed, <laughs> I mean, the Fed has said, shelter inflation needs to come down. And he's already said that we're seeing it in new leases and we're seeing it every single day. You know, rent prices are softening. So, you know, when we're looking at alternatives of what to do with these, with these office buildings, that could be a problem. And in fact, we'll see. I mean, if, 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 if investors are looking for regional banks to bankroll the, project. I'm and I'm not talking about them going out and getting accredited investors or, you know, kind of running a friends and family round of money to, you know, convert and buy an office building, convert it to apartments or a mixed use. You're going to need, if you don't have that, or you don't go through the SEC filings and do an accredited investor, you know, uh, funding, um, round of funding, and you're going to a regional bank with your project, they're going to want a lot of money down and they're going to let you know just how much confidence they have in multifamily housing by, you know, what they will require you to put down on your project in order to get funded. And, you know, they're going to want skin in the game, a lot of cash. And that's the big issue. So as we're looking at these, these downward trends of vacancy rates in offices specifically, because if you think about it, if you have a four-story office building, you probably have 10-foot ceilings, 12-foot ceilings, um, you know, some kind of drop ceiling. You probably have elevators already 
installed, even though it was a 1990s build, you have a, a good skeleton, right? A good um, foundation. When you're looking at the parking requirements back in the day of office buildings, not just not necessarily like the city where, you know, they would allow you to build an office building with street parking um, or garage parking. But, you know, you go in most neighborhoods where you see office buildings, they have big parking lots. So one of the concepts here that they're saying is there, there's a, re, a reduction in density to change an office building to an apartment building because you need less parking spaces. So where your office requirements may be three spaces per thousand or 3.3 spaces per thousand square feet, when you get into apartments, you're like one and a half parking spaces per two bedroom apartment. So there's a reduction of parking requirement. So it's an easier process in a lot of places to convert these buildings, office buildings into apartments. It's expensive. You know, you're going to need to meet, you know, new egress requirements, new fire, you know, life requirements, um, it, depending on what you're getting yourself into. I mean, there may be more stormwater management requirements uh, that they make you do, but you have plenty of parking, right? Plenty of property, essentially, to make these modifications. But the question is going to be, you know, where's the money going to come from, you know, and will investors want to absorb this inventory um, or will the banks, these regional banks just be thrown the keys, toss the keys. Mm. And that is something to think about because if there's more, you know, people moving into these office spaces that are, could be stories and stories high, then you're going to have more population in that area, which is going to lead to traffic issues. Wouldn't there be zoning involved? Um, I think it would be, it's not as simple as that. That's not a quick fix. Well, again, the reduction in density in theory is less traffic. Mm -hmm. So if you figure an office building you're going to have more traffic than you will because you're putting a lot more people in less square footage. Yeah. So when you think about, for instance, an office, you can have an office with one employee per 160 square feet. Well, if you took a two bedroom apartment and made it 320 square feet, that would be tiny. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So you're going to expand your square footage maybe to 700 or 800 square feet. So you're reducing your density to the amount of people that will actually be occupying that space. Yeah. So there's less impact to the community. Um, but which brings up a very good point here when we're talking about people don't realize the impact that it has on our economy when people work from home. Because when you look at infrastructure, just from a, you know, um, a real estate, a commercial real estate aspect, infrastructure, a lot of businesses are planned around employees. So when we take a high density and cram it into, you know, a couple of square blocks, we put a lot of people in there. So if you think about all the businesses that service those office parks, you know, everything from places to eat, get coffee, suppliers, uh, you know, there's a factor, a job factor that really gets changed when you think about now people working at home in their home, versus working in a city or a, you know, a, a very, you know, commerce related area of town. Right. So, you know, that's what a lot of people don't realize. I mean, look, when you have office buildings, you have people cleaning the office buildings, you have, you know, deliveries, office supply deliveries, you have furniture. Uh, so there's a lot of manufacturing, a lot of domestic product that goes in the office and, you know, um, 
that's all getting cast to your home. You know, if you think about toilet paper, paper towels, you know, reams of paper, um, ink for your, you know, your, your printer, people aren't even using it anymore. Very little printing, but that's the, that's the impact that I don't think that people are realizing that when we take jobs and put them in at home, it really does. It changes the uh, commercial real estate landscape. Mm -hmm. We had Graham Matthews here. I mean, I, I do this myself. Starbucks has become the primary office and meeting place for many who work from home. I mean, I meet people at Starbucks all the time for, for meetings, for business meetings. So I agree with that. And there's always the little tables are filled and people having one-on-one meetings. So yes. Yes. I want to show a chart here. Uh, that's very interesting. And thanks Graham for your comment. Uh, because you know, you're right. I mean, coffee shops have really benefited by, um, I mean, what were we talking about? One of our agents, Melissa, and if you're mm-hmm. an agent out there, you, you, this is a good idea for you. Um, one of our real estate agents wants to be known as the, you know, Starbucks uh, real estate expert. So he's planning on just kind of setting up once a week at Starbucks Wednesday morning and come on by, get your coffee and he'll even buy you a coffee and sit down and talk about real estate. What's happening in the real estate market. I thought it was a way cool idea. Uh, Certainly, you know, kudos to, uh, to Sue Hill, shout out to Sue Hill. If he's listening, uh, tonight, one of our agents, very smart, uh, speaking of working and making an office out of Starbucks, Hey, use their electricity, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, buy a, you know, buy a $7 latte and, uh, use their electricity, their Wi-Fi connection and their room as your meeting room, make yeah. it your meeting room. I love it. I, I love it. So. And we can be creative guys, but this is a projection I thought was really interesting. Part of the Cushman and Wakefield, uh, slide, you know, uh, um, uh, resource that they, they put out, uh, in February, the projection here. So in polling, you know, employees and kind of try to determine, you know, in the you know, major countries throughout, uh, the globe, but we just focus on the United States there. So how frequently workers would choose to be in the office if they had it their way. There's a poll here, 43%. So they would never want to be in the office if they weren't forced to be. 40% said hybrid. And what is that? 17% said more than three days a week. Hmm. What do you think about that, Melissa, for somebody that doesn't like to work from home? <laughs> I, don't, I, I do realize I don't think I'm the norm. I don't think um, people, there was a comment here. I think Jeff M made a comment that it's very easy to, I'd have to find it here, um, you know, lose your drive. Um, it's not for everyone. I don't know. You know, I, I kind of agree with the chart that that's what the majority would say. You know, let's talk about, and, and, and I want to know your comments, guys. I mean, you know, comment your thought on this, but I mean, how distracted are you? You know, how much work do you actually get done in the course of a day? You know, I don't know if you're like me, I look at the clock. I have so many things to do in the course of a day. And Melissa, I know you do too, that we're like, what the heck happened? Like, um, I know we're usually like, oh my God, it's four o'clock. You would definitely, I mean, to have to work from home and be structured and disciplined, you'd, you'd got to chart out your time. I don't know how else you would do it. It's just, it's very hard to stay focused for working from home for me anyway. I don't know. It's, as you said, many distractions. It's, it's tough. You know, I can remember back in the, I'd say in the 2000s, I remember, you know, it's interesting. And I guess in the nineties is really when it started actually, but you know, we used to not have CNN and Fox, you know, CNBC and all of these 24 seven news. I remember it was like, I think it was like Iraq, um, the war with Iraq desert storm. And I remember being over at my friend's house and, uh, we were like watching it like 24 seven, you know, we're just like, Oh my gosh, you know, like, look at 
sh- shock and all, like we could see the bombs, you know, the in the back, you know, kind of blowing up and, you know, things that, I mean, 24 seven news coverage, you know, then you have like, you know, the hurricane coverage with the, the weatherman standing out in the middle of the, there's entertainment everywhere, right. Competing with our time. And I remember that it was like, at one point I was thinking like, do I need to put blockers on the computer and block out the things that distract people? Because I was seeing, you know, employees getting on line and the che- internet was taken off and checking out all these, all these other sites and watching the news 10 o'clock in the morning when they should be working. But now we've got a bigger thing to compete with. Everybody's addicted to social media. Right. They're addicted to their phones. They're addicted to texting their friends. I mean, it's like, you know, their blo- the phones are blowing up. You can see them on their desk, lighting up constantly. And, you know, we got a big problem. It's a big problem with distraction. And, you know, so I think that the employers, and this is where I think we've got a a more macro problem in the workforce. Back in 2017, when I went to that conference in Nashville, one of the things that they had said, and I think it was a little, I could be wrong when I say this, but I thought they, they said, Within the next 10 years, so that would be 2027, over 50% of the workforce would be independent contractors. And I don't know about you guys. I'd love to know your thoughts. But I see where that is a real possibility. I mean, because if you're thinking about something, if I'm paying a salary, And now I, the the pressures are going to be on to pay more because inflation, housing, all of the problems that we have now as an employer, I'm faced with getting less work done from the majority of the workforce. I can name all kinds of specifics, specific examples in the last several weeks of going in and shopping and people on their phones, employees can't get people's attention, can't find somebody to help you. Um, It's okay when it's you that's on the phone, but when you're walking through the store, it's frustrating. But I can see where employers are going to be like, you know what? You know, we're, we're not going down this road. We're already seeing employers reduce their size of their office, their office. We're seeing them shut down offices, locations across the country. They're going to permanent workforce at home, you know, work remote workers. Now we're starting to see where some of these people are getting laid off. They're losing their jobs and they're starting their own gig. They're like, you know what? I'm the best at what I do. And I'm going to go after my, I'm going to go after my employer's clients. I'm going to start my own business. They've been dealing with me anyway. So, Hey, I'm going to start my own little side hustle. I can see where employers are going to start hiring out subcontractors, then they can do whatever the heck they want to do in their own time. They want to get on their phone and be distracted and make a eight hour day, three hours of production time. They only get paid for what they do. They get paid per piece. They get paid what they do. They get paid per project. They bid it just like a contractor building an addition on a house. That may not be a bad way. Mm -hmm. Then the people that are go-getters, they're going to have opportunities. And the ones that are lazy well, I guess they'll get more stimulus money. I don't know. But- I don't know. That is interesting, though. But although you look at it in the real estate side, because um, a real estate agent is an independent contractor, and we see them you know, pulling out of being a real estate agent. We see them getting salaried positions. Um, you know, every day. So it depends on, you know, what their expertise is and what they're going to double down on and put, you know, to be their job. I find that to be interesting. Let me tell you some of the things that I've been researching and hearing about as what is required to get people back to work. So we'll start at the top of the list free parking. You know, employees are like, if I'm coming back to the office, I want my parking included. I don't want to take a certain percentage of my salary and pay for parking. 
fitness centers. They want a gym. Hmm. Outdoor space. Windows. Ranks up at one of the top. Shops. Local shops and stores. And it doesn't hurt if there's a Target next door. (laughs) Flexible workspace. Bringing their pets to work. Right? Mm. Coffee bars. Alcohol. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Food. Snacks. Fast Wi-Fi. They want to be able to stream on their oh, phone. They want to get their stuff right. And uh, and kind of last on the must-haves is a conference room. Um, what do you think about that? Well, it's, it's a great wish list. It's almost like you want to be living at home because you probably have the majority of those things at home. So um, why not? And that's what's going to get them to come back to work. I mean, it's like you got to choose three. I don't know. That's a pretty lengthy list. There's a huge, I mean, think about it. Now these, here's what's happening. So now the employers, so there's, people don't realize this maybe, but most employers rent their space. Mm -hmm. They don't own the building. Right. Right. So what's happening is the pressure is on the landlord. You've got two different types of, you have owner occupants, which is the easiest to get a loan for. If you have a business and it's thriving, you want to own your own building. As long as you're occupying space and you're going to be guaranteed, your business guarantees your rent or your mortgage payment or portion, large portion of 50% or more. It's easy to get a financing if you're signing personal and pledging everything. You've been in business, you know, all that good stuff, right? But most business owners, they lease space because what the heck do they want to own the building for, right? They want to be there. They want to expand. It may not fit for them, work for them in five years or whatever. Maybe it's too big. They want to downsize. And as we know, by being homeowners, you're stuck. You know, one of the biggest things why people are renting, we're hearing that people are renting is because they have flexibility. They're not stuck in Nashville, Tennessee or Houston, Texas or Scottsdale, Arizona, they're, they can move, right? They have an apartment, they can relocate jobs. They can go across country. They can, they're free. They can do whatever they want. If they own a house, it's harder. It's more difficult. But now the pressure's on the landlords because these, what's going to happen is a lot of these companies are going to move to the five-star buildings or the class A buildings that have all the new amenities, all the new build outs. So which is going to force a lot of these people that own these buildings um, or are financing these buildings to refinance, to build them out and to try and keep their tenants. Yeah. But I mean, you, so you're, I'm just looking at it from as the, owners of these companies and they want to have all these perks, how much is someone really going to use the gym? I'm not saying that they're not, but I'm saying, I mean, the the chance of them using the gym, I, I just, I don't know. You, you have all these wonderful things and are they really going to be used? I think the thought is good, but when it comes down to it at the end of the day, mm, I don't know. I think people are spoiled. I think people are spoiled. What's the wish list? This is on my wish list. This is all I want. But am I going to use it? Uh, it's hard to say. You know, I was talking about this the other day. And, man, I might lose some subscribers over this. But, you know, I mean, I, you know, and I'm not talking about me specifically. But I probably added to this. But um, we just, ba- we've babied our kids. A lot of us have just babied our kids and tried to make things so easy for them. And we haven't even taught them how to survive and, uh, you know, a downturn and man, they can't, they can't handle it. And, you know, it's, I think that as a result, we're just not grateful for things. Uh, I was listening to something with Warren Buffett and, you know, he was, uh, they were asking him a question. The, um, it was a podcast and, and the, uh, the host was asking a question like, what are the two most important 
business advices that you are three. And I think he got to two of them, but the one that he said was, you know, um, and he did say that he was a bad example of this too. Uh, but he said, you know, take care of yourself, you know, treat, you know, your body, but not just your body, but everything you have, like it's the last one you'll get your car. Perfect example. I mean, you know, if you're looking at the car and it's trashed and they want a new car, but they don't even take care of their existing car, there's trash all over the floor. You got to, you know, kick, you know, um, hot dog, you know, boxes away from your feet to get to your gas pedal. Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't think that we, we're just a society that just hasn't been taught to appreciate things, you know, and I don't want to blanket cover that for everybody. I mean, it's like the shoe fits if it, if it fits you know, but I think that we've gotten spoiled, you know, and a lot of people, you know, I mean, you think about it, you go to these college campuses, man, and they have, you have got, they are posh, these apartment buildings. I mean, they have yeah. theater rooms and, you know, pool rooms and swimming pools inside and out and workout rooms and coffee bar. And here's your card, punch the thing and get your, you know, your, your beverage of choice, whatever. I mean, it's, you know, so I, I don't know. I like, I, I, as an employer, I like the idea that we just start using independent contractors. I hate to say it, but mm -hmm. I think you, you hire out the ones that are, you know, if, if you have to go through and divide, look, I went to the, I went to the store to buy a chair and, um, not an expensive chair. I was thinking it was like big lots or something, whatever. But and um it wasn't crowded. And I walked in and I said to the, I had to find somebody and I said, Look, we picked out the chair. I just want the chair, I just want to pick this chair up, put it on a cart. So I asked for help. A guy was on his phone. He said he would be with me in a couple minutes. He was buried in his phone. <clears throat> I watched him walk from one end of the store to the other end of the store with his phone in, in his hand, staring at it while he was walking right past me. Not, hey, I'll be right over, whatever. I'm not exaggerating. 10, 15 minutes go by. I went and got a cart. Then he comes over and yells at me because I'm not allowed to use the cart. <laughs> well, hey, guess what, buddy? I mean, you know, I'm using the cart because I got to go. You know, be thankful I'm here spending 250 bucks or whatever. So I pay for it. He pushes the cart up to the door. I pay for it. And now I'm standing, I find myself standing for like five minutes waiting for him to come and help me load it up. Finally, I just grabbed the cart, took it outside and loaded it up myself. And he came out at the end and said, I told you customers aren't supposed to use the carts. Not, I'm sorry, nothing, whatever, whatever. No, look, this is what it's coming down to, right? So now we've got, you know, people working from home. We have employers that are losing a grip on their company. You know, we should be digging in deeper now more than ever because times are going to get tough. They are tough. And for these people that aren't working and producing and, you know, thinking that life is grand and they just want to stay home in their Uggs and, you know, sip their coffee and go to Target 11 o'clock, one o'clock in the afternoon, you may be up for a rude awakening one day when your employer decides to say, see it yeah i mean so much time has passed they are it's expected to get pushback that you know for these employees to go back to the office it's you know it's expected this is this has been a long period of time it really has you look back to the beginning of all of this i mean we're over three years now and it's really hard to be able to get back and you, you've become accustomed to that and that has been um, the routine for you. And then all of a sudden you have to make these changes. That is hard for some people to, to have to do that. And then they're being forced to do it. And, and some of these companies even said like, we're done, you're working remote forever. And now they're like, well, we're, we're, we're changing that. So I don't know. Hey, I have a slide here. Yeah. Let's take a look at this one. 
These are some winners and losers, top performers and bottom performers in 2022 of office vacancies, some of the highest office vacancies across the country and some of the lowest. You can see there, um, Tuscaloosa, Alabama is down 1.2% in 2022. That's pretty good. So they're, maybe they don't have a lot. I don't know anything about Tuscaloosa. Do you? Mm, I do not. Maybe they have like three buildings there. I don't know. Maybe. Please let us Santa know Raphael, if you're from there. Let us know. California, 19.3% uh, vacancy rate. Houston, Texas, 188 Dallas, Texas, 17.2%. These are devastating vacancy rates, by the way. These are vacant. These mm. aren't under lease and empty. These are vacant buildings, vacant offices. This is huge. Yeah. Right? I mean, we're looking double-digit vacancies here. Atlanta, Los Angeles, Denver, Phoenix, Chicago, Washington, D.C., San Francisco. I mean, craziness, right? It really Something is. And it's eerie, too. When you walk by those office buildings, I mean, I have in Washington, D.C., I've you know been down there and there's vacancies down there in certain parts. This also by Cushman Wakefield's report over lying current inventory projected deliveries and natural rate of vacancy of 13 percent the u.s market is on track to have 1.1 billion square feet of vacant office space by the end of the decade 55 percent more than prior to the pandemic in the fourth quarter of 2019 of this 1.1 billion square feet of vacant space 740 million square feet is considered normal or natural vacancy and that's given that a certain percentage of office stock is always vacant to accommodate future growth mm. so the the projection is that this is going to continue. Now, what happens during these, I mean, you take these vacant office buildings. A lot of these buildings, the banks are going to own. If you're a real estate investor and you're listening to this, this is opportunity. This is good. There will be big opportunity to pick up office buildings for cheap, I think. You know, when we do haven't you even think, gotten Todd? into... When do you like, what's, what, what is your, in your mind, what is the timeline for that? When it's going to be huge opportunity for all this office space. I mean, I, I think you have to look at the average lease across, you know, the country. So if we just take a uh, figure a five year as an, as, I would say that's even high. I'd say most small businesses are running three year leases. Uh, with options, maybe five three-year options or three three-year options, but even five-year, if you look at that and you go back to a lot of these businesses, you know, some of them got PPP money, the payroll protection, right. they kept things going. Um, a lot of them, they're out of that by now. But if you just look at, you know, a lot of them haven't renewed their lease or go a month to month. There was a poll that was not uh, done that long ago. I think it was in November that there was a huge amount. It was double digits. I think it was like 40% of commercial tenants were, had not paid their October lease in November. And, you know, and the, the thing is, is that it does not make people feel safe when they're pulling into an office and there's no one there. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, so, and no one wants to see vacant buildings because loitering takes place, you know, uh, it, it's just all kind. you know, you start to see graffiti painted on the walls. Uh, you know, the building owners are struggling. They don't cut the grass as often, uh, you know, things like that happen. And no one wants that to see that that brings property values down. So, you know, I would think if we're just looking off of average leases, probably, you know, certainly into the end of this year, 24, 2025, I think we're going to start to see major impact uh, to the commercial space. So much of it is just not desired, right? So if you think that you're a thriving business, you need an office space, you're going to move to a five-star building where you can attract your employees to come back by giving them amenities 
And, you know, people are, we'll, we will probably get back to, you know, Uber or, you know, some kind of, um, you know, um, transportation service taking us to and from home. If you're living in the cities, uh, you know, so parking lots aren't important for people. Big drop off areas become more important, uh, you know, for the people that are coming to work. Uh, recreation. I mean, it's going to be a time when people get together if they're on a remote or, you know, some type of hybrid model when they're bringing people back to the offices to get them together for camaraderie, for training, for m company meetings, things like that. So, you know, the amenities are going to be really important to these employers. So they're going to be moving to these other buildings. And I think you're going to, you, you, you'll, we may see, some absorption in shared office space. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the we work that got crushed during the pandemic because now no one wanted to sit in an open space and be coughed on. Right. Uh, you know, they were thinking like, oh my gosh, we screwed up. We made open workspace and now we need private. So they were like, what the heck did we just do? I mean, we've interviewed architects on the show, you know, in commercial space. They were saying how they're just so happy they're doing all this great community space and things like that. Well, when the pandemic hit, <laughs> That went out the window. People didn't want to sit next to somebody, but I think we'll get back to that. I think we'll mm -hmm. see where. So what happened is these wholesalers will come in and this is opportunity too. If you're an investor listening, you may go into that building owner and say, look, you're struggling to pay your rent. You have a bunch of month to month tenants here. Move them, move them to different floors. I want to rent the whole first floor or I want to rent the whole second floor. I'll guarantee the whole second floor. And then what they'll do is they will fit it out to a shared office space. Because let's face it, if independent contractors are going to increase, which I believe they will, I think employees will decrease, independent contractors will increase. That would be the desired um, hire for a lot of employers, independent contractors, pay them a little bit more money per hour, not have to carry them health insurance, not have to carry them on all these other costs, FICA, Medicare. 7.65%. It's a big number. You know, workers' compensation insurance, they'll push that off to the subcontractor. The subcontractor is not going to want to meet people at their house. They have little kids. They have, you know, they're married or whatever. Their private space. Maybe it's, in sh maybe they may be embarrassed to bring them back. I mean, who knows? Or they may not want them to see their mansion. They're going to want to take them someplace and not always is a noisy Starbucks an option. So I think the WeWork space will be that meant, you know, that, that kind of business model will be very hot and could be a very good solution. If you investors, you know, entrepreneur minded people out there thinking about this, you know, start being proactive, you know, start sending letters to these building owners saying, look, you, you live in Boca. You haven't seen your building and it, you've had a, you, you've had a real estate brokerage sign on it for so long that says for lease that the paint's faded. The banner's ripped. I'll release the whole floor from you, you know, and go in and, and, and do something like that. I think that will be big business and, and where office space will be headed. We had Travis um, do a super chat. Thank you for all your hard work. And thank you, Travis. I've, I've thrown Travis for a loop, man, because we're not talking about the housing market. Thanks, buddy. We appreciate you as always. He's probably already signed off. I bored him with office talk. <laughs> we had um, Mary Rangel make a comment here. Recruiter and hospitality here. So, so many real estate professionals applying for entry level hourly positions these days. I've heard numbers like over 200,000 real estate agencies have hung up their uh, license since like June. Um, you know, it's a big problem because, you know, back in 2008, when the market crashed, if you told somebody you were a real estate agent, the next thing that came out of their mouth was, what else do you do? Uh, because, you know, most agents got jobs uh, because, you know, how long can you sustain not making any money? And now's the time where you really have to be a professional and you have to work. 
You have to dig in. You have to dig deep. You have to commit. You have to niche market. You have to focus just like any other business that's out there. It's easy when, you know, when the, when the, the um, harvest is great, you know, it's easy to make money. You can screw off in your job. You can quit, go find another job. When the next 10 years, we're not going to be that lucky. That's why I tell a lot of these people that are saying they're going to quit their job if their boss calls them back. And I say, you better not. As an employer, you better not. You'll be thinking of ways, they'll be thinking of ways to get rid of you. You better not. You better show your worth. Dig in, do something, be something, help your boss make it, help your employer be successful, not for them necessarily, but for yourself, because that's how you find other opportunities. When you serve somebody, and you serve a client and they, and I'm not trying to get somebody in a store. You think I'm going to go hire that guy? Ask that guy to come to work for me. The guy that made me lift my own chair and put it on a cart and told me I couldn't use the cart, scolded me because of it. What a jerk, right? You think I, he's not hireable. He's not employable. He is completely lucky that he has a job, probably because his manager's terrible too. And they're just bleeding the company out, right? This is where we are right now, guys. We need to be professional, get back to customer service. It will shine. What I tell the agents now is there is never a better time to get as many buyers and sellers ever. You got less competition. Everybody's crying. Everybody's, you know, going through the gravy, you know, now they got to work. Now they have to pick up the phone. Now they got to go knock on doors. Now they have to spend some money by sending mailers and postcards and letters. Mm -hmm. I just talked to an agent today and she said that that is what is so hard is that being in this market right now and prospecting and picking up the phone and calling and how difficult it is because she didn't need to do that in these past couple of years. And now she's got to really work and it's challenging. Oh, it's out of your gosh. comfort zone. It's got to really work. You know, I mean, here, here's the number one thing we hear, Melissa, with agents calling the office, right? We've got a non-eligible, right? I mean, it's like, we, no, stay away. You know, um, you know, number one thing they're calling, they're like, do you give us leads? Do you give us, do you give us a paycheck? Do you give us a salary? Do you get, are you going to pay my insurance? Are you, what are you going to do for me? It's like, that ship sailed. What are you going to do for us? You know, what are you going to do for your own career? Well, it, the, the, the free is look now you got to work guys. I mean, this is, this is just from somebody that's been in business for a very long time, 34 in 1989. <laughs> it's a long time. I've seen this go up and down, up and down. I've never seen employees like this. I've never seen work ethic like this. You know, talking about, I'm not going back to work. If I have to go back to work, I'm quitting. I'm going to go got, find another job. You might not have to go find another job on your own. You may have to, they might make the decision for you. Mm -hmm. I did have another question here. Oh, Charlton Zimmerman always has the best comments and input. Um, Wi-Fi changed office space as no longer required hardwire internet. It's very true, man. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we're experiencing that right now, Charlton, in our uh, new building that, uh, you know, we're building out our podcast studio. And uh, I mean, you know, we didn't even run Cat 5 or Cat 6. We didn't even run it. We have access points and that is it. Uh, you know, we will have, you know, some hardwired plugged in devices, but I mean, the you know, Wi-Fi connection so good. I mean, we have extenders. We we have agents can work outside. Uh, they have Wi-Fi outside. I mean, they can work outside in picnic tables, and uh, and still be connected with fast. I mean, and we upload and download videos all the time. I mean, we're you know very we're, everything we use. We don't have we don't even have a server. Everything we use is online, right? I used to have a server room. Talk about wasted space. 
a rack with all kinds of switching, <laughs> all that stuff. Man, that is gone. Everything is web-based, accessible from anywhere in the world. As yeah. long as you have an internet connection, you're good. Now, of course, we'll go to war here shortly, and they'll probably attack our, and we'll all be like, oh, man, where's the typewriter? Shoot, man, I can't even send it. I can't even drop off a letter. I don't even have a typewriter. My computer won't work. Printer won't work. Phones won't work. <laughs> We we'll wish we all had horses. We're talking about electric cars. <laughs> we might wish we we may wish we had a horse to oh get into town. Gosh. Since you are a broker, how about answering Anne's question? I'm interested in getting a real estate license. Do you think I should start planning? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, so here's the thing about, and I appreciate this question, uh, Anne. You know, you have to love people. You know, I had a friend of mine that um, had a restaurant business and I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, you know, uh, and, and now it's, it's really successful and he has franchises and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, I remember, and this is going back 25 years. And I remember sitting at his restaurant, eating dinner with him and another friend mutual friend of ours. And I said, man, like you are really fortunate. Like everybody is so nice. I'm like what's the secret? And he quickly said, Todd, if you hire people and you need the people to be nice, you hire nice people. You don't hire the people and tell them they have to be nice. And I thought, wow, that's crazy right? Sounds simple. If you want to get your real estate license, you have to love people because you see your clients at their very, very worst. When people are stressed out, you deal with them at their worst and you can be offended. And that's not easy. But at the end of the day, if you are the professional and you love people and you do, you serve them, you want to serve number one and you put their needs over yours. And I mean this, I do this every single day. Melissa, she'll vouch for it. My mm -hmm. clients, number one, right? Most of the time they apologize to you after settlement. They'll say, man, I was, I'm so sorry, man. I was so nasty. I was so mean. How did you even put up with me? You know what? You're like, you know what? In a real estate transaction, good agents become extended family and best friends to their clients because you know you know them intimately, inside, outside. You see them at their worst. I've seen couples fight, couples split up, couples get divorced over, you know, building a house, uh, you know, going through a new home builder, being stressed out, um, not moving into the house, selling it. Commercial real estate, what we've been talking about most of the show, which was kind of fun because <laughs> a little break from residential. Commercial is more, is, is less emotional. It's mostly about numbers, stats, demographics, foot traffic, car traffic, uh, what side of the road they're on. They're in the going to work, coming home side of the street. You know, a lot of times businesses don't even realize they're on the wrong side mm -hmm. of the road. That's why they're not successful. Um. But yeah, if you're interested in getting your real estate license, you know, my tips are this, they're these, you know, get it. If you love people, you want to serve people. It's like starting any other business. You cannot enter the real estate industry undercapitalized. Seven, 10,000 bucks you at least have to have in the bank. You can't start on a shoestring. You will be broke. Number one reason businesses fail is undercapitalization. They get a great idea. They get excited. Life kicks them around and they're out in no time flat because they were undercapitalized. Support network's big. If you have a spouse, it's going to, you know, beat you over the head every time you come home and don't make a sale. It's going to be stressful. 
right? And I don't mean that literally. I just mean, you know, like, hey, why, you know, you've been doing this for three months now. You haven't sold anything. When are you going to get a real job? It, it's not working, right? So you, you need a good support group. You need some cash, seven to 10,000 bucks to start your business. My best advice is I would probably join a team. I would, you know, join a brokerage where, you know, if I had to do it all again, I'd pick a top team, learn as much as you can, hustle, do whatever they want you to do, build a name for yourself. And even if it means giving a large percentage of your commission away, so what? You know, it's better to do that and have a good mentor that's working with you every single day than to be lost on your own because you're in competition with everybody in your office. So no one will help you. You know, you're going to be walking in as a lone wolf, which is fine if you're a hunter and, you know, you can survive in that environment. But now is the best time to get in the business because you didn't know what it was like when you could just go outside and open up your mouth and catch a million gnats in your mouth because they were flying everywhere. That's a disgusting analogy. <laughs> Not the clients are gnats, but I'm just saying, you know, now you're going out wishing you could catch a gnat. Mm. You know, but it's, it does, it, it makes it, it's so much easier to succeed when you start now, when you, you actually get back to business basics, it's easy guys. It's easy, you know, serving people, being a voice, getting out there. We get a ton of leads that come in our office. You guys all over the country, we direct people to agents all throughout the country in our broker network. If you need an agent, reach out to us. Joe can put up the email, email me, um, you know, where you're looking for an agent. And, uh, or if you're in Maryland, we'd love to help you too. If you're not represented, that's another thing. We just had somebody from Maryland reach out and, um, you know, they had said that they had a Maryland brokerage and uh, they were not happy and wanted some advice from me. Uh, when you sign agency, if you're in my state and you sign agency with another broker in Maryland, buyer agency in this case, or even if you're listing, uh, having a house for sale and you've signed an agency agreement with a listing brokerage, I can't really give you, uh, don't tell me that you have, don't tell me you have representation because if you do, I can't right. really help you. You know, um, it would be against my, you know, uh, brokerage laws. Mm -hmm. We've had They're a few calls another attorney. In, um, in the past in the past two weeks actually that have been um, really wanting to talk to you when they were under agency. So that is just something to uh, make sure that you're not with another brokerage. Definitely. You know, I don't know what, what agency agreement you're signing, but our agency agreement could be terminated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't want to hold anybody's feet to the fire. Uh, you know, uh, if they're not happy with me, or any of our agents, um, we let them out of our agency agreement. But I, there are certain states, and I've witnessed this, Tennessee being one of them, where there is at least what the agreement that I saw from this brokerage in Tennessee for a client, um, there was no out in the buyer agency. And I'm like, what's up with that? There's no out. You can't fire you if you suck. And she was like, well, you know, we don't really worry about the contract. We'll let them out anyway. And I'm thinking, well, I don't like that. I'm a statutory state here in Maryland and it's in writing and what it says stands and my agreements could be canceled. Yeah. So, you know, if you're listening to this, make sure if you're signing agency agreements with anybody on the resident. If you're signing agency agreements on the residential side, make sure you know what you're signing. Let's see. Let's look at another question here. And bear with me just one moment. We had, oh, the Duke said, is there a Colin? We need to have another Colin show, Todd. We need to do that. So that was a good time last time. It was great to hear from all of you. Yeah, it was fun. We would definitely yeah. have to do this. We we have just a little uh, sneak peek, guys. We have some really cool shows coming up. We do. Yeah, we've got some. We got some guests that are going. They're going to blow you away. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, you're going to be like, what? Yep. So if you haven't subscribed to our channel, you can always unsubscribe, but <laughs> if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Because, and if you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. But if you haven't subscribed, subscribe because you'll get the alerts, hit the alert bell, and uh, you'll know when we have these, you know, come up. And Joe's showing you there how to do it. It's nice and easy. Um, and then that way you'll be notified. You'll get a little email notification if you're a, if you're a Gmail user. or You don't have to be Gmail, I don't think, with YouTube. Um, but you have to register, sign in or whatever, and then... You'll be alerted when we go live and when we post other videos, but we've got some really cool guests that you're going to want to hear from. And we're going to, we're going to kind of split it up a little bit. We've got, um, we have another channel too. We'll plug that. And if you subscribe to it and you're wondering where's the content, it's coming. We're working on it. It's called Real Estate Agent. It's a new channel. If you go down to the bottom of our Saks Realty channel, um, you'll see it there, real estate agent. Uh, you can click on that, subscribe to it. If you're serving the industry, your real estate agent, uh, it will be a very, very resourceful channel for you. We've got our first agent interview on there. Don't quit. A lot of people are quitting. A lot of agents are quitting. Uh, Rachel Smith, she's a local agent here. She's a rock star. I inter interviewed her. Uh, but we have uh, another really uh, good video on there about title. A lot of people don't understand what title companies do and why you need a title company and how they do abstract work to make sure that your you know, uh, property is what you're buying something that's free and clear and all that stuff. But anyway, um, yeah, check it out. If you're serving the industry, it may, not, it may be boring for you if you're just a buyer or seller or just somebody that likes real estate this kind of stuff. You may not like the more um, agent related content. If you're serving mortgage or title, it definitely will benefit you too. Mm -hmm. This we is did kind of a have... fun show, different, huh, Melissa? This was nice. This was nice. It was like we we're just hanging out in the office and having some conversation. So um, I liked it. I liked it. But yeah, we've got some great guests coming up and um, that's going to be really fun. So this was just a nice little break. Any more questions that. we could take yeah. before we start off? How do you feel about talking about the Midwest here? We do have um, a question. Any thoughts on the Midwest housing market? Always see it being touted as affordable, but sellers are still listing their houses for a hundred thousand more than what they bought it for a couple of years ago. You know, um, everywhere has really, I mean, um, the inflation on housing over the last several years has really been off the chain. Uh, I, I don't think, I mean, what? Uh, our appraiser last week said that in his backyard, they didn't see the appreciation so much. Yeah. Yeah. Where was that? He was in Michigan. Uh, Joe, do you remember where that was? Oh, oh, was it Ann Arbor, Michigan? Yeah, I think, I think it was Ann Arbor maybe. Oh, oh no, no, no. Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. I think it was Grand Rapids. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 You know, I think that, you know, a lot of the country's gone up. It has escalated and the Midwest was, <clears throat> was really no different, but I think what we're seeing is that there are a lot of markets that are drastically coming down. I mean, we're getting comments from our viewers where, you know, they're seeing 40%, you know, 12, 14, 16% price drops. Um, you know, we've certainly, you know, had a lot of people that have said like, where's the crash, that kind of thing. Uh, but what we really have to focus on and think about and look at is that they're not selling like they were and things have to be priced right in order to get competitive bids and they have to be fixed and in good working order. So we're not seeing so much of the people going in blind with zero contingencies that was the insanity. And then the other thing I want to caution you guys is we're not through this. We're not through this. And I, I know this is another thing that is hard for a lot of people to grasp. We have an inventory shortage right now. 
that is good. That eventually is going to change. We still have a lot of people that are holding on to Airbnbs, you know, rental properties that they're getting tenants out of that they're done with. They're going to be putting it on the market. You know, what's going to happen with foreclosure eventually? Who knows? I think things are being propped up and kept up right now because of, you know, the election that's coming up. Yeah. That's what I think. We're not through the woods, guys. When we hit the peak in 2006, it took years. It took to 2012, 2013 before we started seeing appreciation again. We started seeing, you know, people not be able to get out of their house for their purchase price when that they paid for it in 2006. People are underwater. They have zero equity. They can't sell their house. They put three and a half percent down. A lot of them, you know, we keep hearing people say, well, you know, they paid cash. They did this. They did that, that investors did that and move up buyers and move down buyers that sold their prices at top dollar. First time buyers, 30 some percent, 36% of the buyers over the last several years did not pay cash. Okay. Good. They got money from mom and dad that they ate up and over appraised to buy mm -hmm. the home because they had to pay over appraised value and they had to pay cash for that. So when people were like, I put $50,000 down. Yeah. 50 grand over appraised value to get your house. You put three and a half percent down on your house. Mm -hmm. We have Andre here who um, made a comment. Thank you for your comment. Like you said, nobody is willing to let the quote market rent go down. If the price keeps going up forever, we'll demand more also, places kept empty because the fair market value would hurt nearby comps. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Um, you know, they're, it's the same thing with builders right now. I mean, builders have a lot of empty houses. And, you know, that's what they're dealing with. Yeah. You know, right now. They're so we have sitting empty. They don't want to drop the price because, I mean, they're going to really, they're going to hurt themselves. You know, what about the people that just, you know, over the last year, they're still delivering houses that sold six months ago. We had Roberto. Are you saying the price drops are a sign that it's just getting started? In my opinion, Yes. In my opinion, yes. I, I don't know. Every market will behave differently, but I think that we haven't seen the bottom. You know, some people say the bottom's here. The Fed would have to pivot. We'd have to see, you know, if you believe what the Black Knight, the mortgage experts are producing, putting out there, saying everybody, you know, we're going to go back to four and a half, five percent uh, in 2025, 2024. If you believe that, that mortgage rates are going to drop anytime soon, then probably what I'm saying is, you know, um, maybe we are at the bottom. But I think that we're seeing a, um, I think we're seeing a dive. I, I, I mean, look, I, I don't want to, you know, start something that I can't finish here tonight or even get into. But I think we're going to see some craziness happen in the next couple months. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think that at the very least, we're going to see unemployment rates go up. And I think we're going to see, you know, I know people don't want to hear that, but I, I, I would, I think we would be naive to think that off the highest peak that we've ever seen in the history of the housing market, inflation at the highest level that we've seen in generations to think that this little bit of a blip or downturn again, how are we going to pay for this guys? I still believe, I mean, what am I missing? If you're, if, if you know what I don't know, let me know because I don't know how I'm just telling you that employers are looking for ways to get rid of employees and cut their costs. A lot of them automation. 
Uh, we haven't even started talking about the chat bot and all these things. I mean, look, I, I mean, I know we don't want to talk about this stuff, you know, because every time Todd starts to talk about it, it's negative. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to say well, we have to be realistic here. We got to start take pulling our heads out of the sand and saying, you know, let's be smart here, guys. Hey, look, let me tell you something. If you save money over the next six months and things don't get any worse than where they are right now, what's the worst case scenario? You got a lot of money in the bank that you can be prepared. If you've prepared, you started saving money. Now you can afford a house more than ever before, right? Start saving your money. Yeah, we have CEU solution. If the past cycles are any indication of what will happen in the future, then we should expect the bottom won't happen until 2028 ish. Yeah, now I think now, now here's the other thing, and this is a good point too. I'm glad that you're bringing this up. In 2006, when we had the peak. I think YouTube was founded in 2004. Maybe it was 2004, 2005. It was, I mean, it was next to nothing, right? The newspaper was the number one way of finding things out in 2006, right? So I think it took a little bit longer for that to happen, the bottom to kind of hit because you know, the news didn't travel as fast. But what happens now is the hysteria phase goes much faster because we have access to it nonstop. Social media. I mean, I, the, the biggest thing was when, you know, when I'm watching, you know, the Russia-Ukraine, you know, war, um, I'm like, man, it's all like on TikTok. Man. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I didn't even need the TV. I, I I could watch blow by blow from the soldiers in the field, right? So things are pat. We get this information very quick now. Mm -hmm. So do I think it will go all the way out to 2028? I mean, I, I don't know, uh, but I wouldn't think so. I think that, um, I think that over the next six to 12 months, we're probably going to see a lot of buyer remorse. We're probably going to see a lot of short sales. And they won't be necessarily foreclosures, but people will just be thrown in the keys because they can't afford to live there. Not just because they're not paying their mortgage, but something breaks and they can't fix it. If the heating and air system goes out in your house, I don't care whether the company foreclosed on you or not, you're probably going to move out when your pipes freeze and you can't heat your house in the wintertime. So I think that we'll start to see the cycle happen. Um, you know, whatever's going to show up is going to show up probably in the next, you know, six months, we'll start seeing it, 12 months, whatever. We'll have a better idea as we get into this election year of what kind of prop ups we're going to see, or, you know, what kind of fights we're going to see or what, you know, how everything's going to unfold. Uh, but this current administration doesn't want to see things collapse and probably, <laughs> you know, uh, people that would love to be in power would probably want it to collapse. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I heard somebody say, um, um, and I don't want to tell you who it is because then you'll think I, you, you'll try and figure out, you know, what I, I listen to everybody, but somebody had said in an interview that I was listening to that there's two things that keeps an administration in power, right? One is a booming economy. The other one's war. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, but you know, if you think about it, um, you know, I think that we've got a lot of things that are going on. All you got to do is listen to the news. Certainly, I'm sure tons of it's propaganda. Uh, but you are smart enough that you can read between the lines and see where things are headed. I mean, if you're going to try and predict now, you know, we get this all the time. They're like, well, when do I buy a house? Do I buy it now or do I wait six months, right? And I always tell the people, if you find the property that checks all the boxes, you know you're going to stay in town. You know, you're not going to leave your job. You're not planning on it. You're not going to skip out the next three years and want to sell your house. And you have six months of cash after you pay all your closing costs, your down payment. And you can withstand a little personal downturn. And you want to buy a house and own it and get into ownership 
and fix it up the way that you want it, then buy it. If you're on the sideline and you're going, well, you know, I could buy, but I, it would be everything that I have. And I don't know whether I'm going to stay there for five, seven, 10 years. It may, it, you may want to sit on the sideline on this one and wait. What's the worst case scenario? You get your stuff together, you save more money, and then you find something later that you want. You know, and then you say, oh, well, I'm paying $20,000 more for it. So what? If you can afford it over the 30 year period of the loan, it's not going to wipe you out. What will wipe you out is buying when it's not a good time and getting into the FOMO stage of competing for something and getting yourself to a price that you can't afford if something were to happen. This is the problem. This is where a lot of these buyers are right now. They're like, man, I can't believe it. My furnace went up. You know, my roof is bad. You know, my garbage disposal broke. My water heater's gone up. It leaked into, I mean, I'm hearing all kinds of things from people who are like, man, that's 3000 bucks. Yeah. We don't have it. If you bought a house and you're a happy homeowner and you don't have 3000 bucks in the bank, that's scary. That's scary. The house owns you. Mm-hmm. You don't, you're, you're not, it's not, life is not enjoyable. You are stressed out. You're in debt. You know, that's what we've been preaching, Melissa. So, you know, we're not trying to tell people not to buy a house. Well, I think everyone is so focused. I don't want to say everyone, but especially first time home buyers, they're getting that calculation from the lender and they're looking at that, that that's what they need to afford for their monthly payment, but they're not being also guided. I'm not saying this is across the board with all lenders because that's not true, but they're not necessarily being guided that, you know, you, you need to have like this little savings because of all the things that can go wrong in your home. Um, and then they're in a jam. And then that's what we're hearing right now, unfortunately. Um, although it did came come to notice to me today that like a VA loan, for example, is assumable. And now I'm not a lender. I would need specifics on this. But that was something interesting that I was thinking of, you know, like a buyer could assume a seller's VA loan and you don't have to be a veteran for that. I'd like to dive into that a little bit more, but one of our agents mentioned that today and I thought that that was, I was like, oh, that's actually could be a good strategy. Um, I'd like to talk to a lender and get some more information about that, but that was something interesting that I heard today. Yeah. You know, and, and then there's all kinds of rules with that. I mean, you know, whether they can, the, you know, the uh, seller that has the VA loan that's being assumed, you know, I'm sure there's criteria on, I mean, they're going to want to buy something else. Uh, right. You know, so check with the lender on that, you know, uh, you know, um, as far as whether you'll qualify, you know, uh, to get another VA loan. Um, but, you know, will we see assumable loans? I mean, we may, you know, more, I mean, I think there are, loans are assumable. I'm not a, you know, mortgage expert don't want to be, um, but, uh, you know, the only thing I'm going to say is that the price is the most important thing, not the interest rate you make, you know, people want to think about houses and as an investment. And for many, it's the only investment. If it is an investment, the only one that they make in their entire lifetime, And, you know, of course it does appreciate through time, but it appreciates as you're spending money too, uh, because if you don't keep it up, it's going to depreciate, it's going to fall apart. And, you know, but the thing is, um, the price is what matters. The key in real estate, if you ask people, they say, yeah, the world's billionaires, most of them became rich in real estate. Yeah. But you know what they did? (laughs) They bought low and sold high. So it's not buy high and hope to sell higher. That's not how you make money in real estate. So, you know, these lenders want to say, you know, date the rate. That is the biggest bunch of crap. What we've done is we have convinced people. This is the problem in America. 
We have convinced them to be payment based. You still have the piece of crap for the same payment. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what the, ba- the payment that deteriorates. You got to put money into it continually. You go out and you buy a car and you, you owe the payment. So I'm going to finance it for seven years. It breaks down. It rusts out. It falls apart. It, it is that you're, you're buying the payment. Well, you're stuck with the payment. If you can't sell what you bought and get out or pay the loan off, you're stuck. And that's where people are. A lot of these people. You have to have at least 10% equity on your house in most cases across the country to get out, to sell it, to pay for your fees, pay your loan off, your mortgage off, or at least get your money back of what you paid for the house. People say, well, I put down $40,000 or 20%, so I don't need to sell it for 10% more to pay off my mortgage. No, but chances are you're losing money. What kind of an investment is that? You know, so that's just what I what I like to caution people or tell people when they're looking at this thing. You know, they get hung up on the rate. They get hung up on the payment. Yeah, you can refinance it. There's costs to do that. Make sure you ask the lender about that. And you may need to put more money down to order to refinance. And then ask your lender, just how much do the rates need to change in order for it to make a difference? And they're going to tell you, well, it makes you, you can do it at a point, but as long as you live there for 10 years to pay off the fees, the extra fees to recapture what you spend to refinance it. Of course, they like it when you do because they get to refinance it for you. They don't need to give you the original loan. They get credit for the entire refinance of your house. So, you know, watch who you take your advice from. I'm not saying Mm -hmm. take it from me. But just do your due diligence and be smart about it. But I still think we, I still think we're going to see, you know, a lot of the, and here's a lot of the crashing that we talk about price crash in real estate. A lot of that has to do with distressed real estate. And not everybody can buy distressed real estate because they can't get loans for it, FHA, VA, sometimes conventional loans for it. You got to do renovation loans to buy distressed property. But that's where you see your biggest price crash. But if we see 10%, which we have, that's what I called from the beginning, 10%. Go back and listen to my videos. Most of the, a lot of the markets, we've seen 10% price reductions. Yes, a lot of the markets, we've seen price increases, but they've been based on jobs, job market, holding on by a thread. See some of those job you know, markets soften, which is predicted. You know, when the Fed met the Congress, Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, he asked Jay Powell, in order to get down to 2% inflation, you if we're looking at numbers historically from the, you know, and over time, we would need unemployment to get to 10% to get down to 2% inflation. Because historically, that's what would be required or what would be expected to get down to 2% inflation. Now we're faced with new issues on, you know, banks, $4 trillion, you know, set aside $4 trillion set aside for banks as to be able to get loans at par in order to save themselves from collapse or bank runs or people panicking. What happened back in March, right? With, you know, um, SVB and a couple others. Mm-hmm. And people were like, oh, well, you know, look, banks, have they've invested the money that the depositors have put in. So as a result of that, they don't have the money to give you if everybody goes in and says, I want my money. And that shook things up a little bit. Drop mortgage rates a little bit. It's just, it's temporary. Credit's tightening. Credit's tightening. Credit card debt is off the chart. People are in debt. They don't have savings. They're in debt. Credit's tightening. Home prices are high. Even the ones that dropped, still high. You know, and they're sitting on the market. Houses are sitting on the market. These sellers are like, is $5,000 enough of a price drop? No. No, your your house is eight fifty. dollars 
5,000 bucks is nothing. If they're not buying it at 850, have they offered you 845? Well, no. Okay, well, it's they're dropping it to 845 is not going to get it done, right? I mean, so the sellers have to make decisions, and this is what we're seeing. The sellers either have to make the decision to take it off the market or improve the price. If it's been on the market for four months and nobody's written you an offer, they don't see the value in your property. I hate to tell you that. So you either have to take it off the market or drop the price Mm -hmm. or wait it out. Days on the market's not your friend in this market. I tell my buyers, we're going to try and get you a deal. You want a deal? You want some sweat equity? We're going to look at stuff that's been on the market for 21 days or more, 30 days or more, 45 days or more. Yeah, but I don't like that house. No, neither does anybody else. That's why it's been on the market for 45 days. Now we're going to go in. We're going to offer them a price that makes you like it because now you'll have the money to fix it up and make it the way you want. As long as it's in the area that checks the boxes, as long as the neighbors don't have barking dogs or a junkyard in the back, it's things that we can't change, but you know, they're kind of that strategy is that if you want your best deal, don't look at the house that went on the market two days ago and is under pending or the agents like, Put your highest and best in by four o'clock tomorrow and you better not have any contingencies. If you're messing around in that playground, you don't belong. If you're looking for a deal, let them have it. Let them have it. You're coming back saying, well, their price hasn't dropped. The house down the street from me sold. There was 18 offers and it sold for $15,000, $25,000 over list price. Look at the houses that haven't. You'll get your best deal. You'll get your best deal. You know, focus on the contingencies. Focus on getting the money back for repairs. Focus on what you can do. Don't worry about the 1776 wallpaper in the dining room. Right? By the way, that was... I had 1776 wallpaper... In our office, Melissa, that's why it made me think of that. <laughs> There's like seven layers of wallpaper. And as we were peeling it back, somewhere I have them, little cutouts of each one. There was a bicentennial wallpaper. Mm, I love that. Blue in the dining room. Yeah, but anyway, nice. guys, that's what you want to do. We love you guys. We appreciate you so much. Yeah. Great show. Great show, Todd. Thank you. This Thanks, is really Melissa. great, Thank everybody. You. Yo, you're welcome. And um, we will be doing our follow-up for all of the questions that we weren't able to get to tonight. Um, But this was a great show. And thank you so much. Guys, like I said, if you haven't subscribed, please do so now. And pass this along to one of your family members or a friend. Uh, Don't keep this information to yourself. We love it when you share our channel. And we will see you next time. See you next time.